Lord Jesus, truly your words are wonderful. Your words are life-giving. And truly we would go nowhere else. We could go nowhere else to find your promises, to find your goodness, to find all that we have in you. We could not ask for a better savior. We could not ask for a better shepherd nor a better Lord. You are God of all gods, king of all kings, the sovereign maker and sustainer of the universe, and you are good. There is no one bigger or stronger that could snatch us out of your hands. And there is no one who matches your character, your kindness, your compassion towards sinners. You indeed are our refuge, the only refuge our anchor, our only anchor, our hope and our help. As we look to your words even now, Lord Jesus, would you be glorified in our hearing of them? May your words resonate in our hearts. And truly, we need you even for that. We ask for your help in it, in your name. Amen. You may be seated. We turn now to the last public dialogue of the Lord Jesus in his earthly ministry recorded in the Gospel of John. And really fantastic that we just sang the words we sang. We find in John chapter 10 wonderful words on the lips of our Savior, the Good Shepherd. And yet these life-giving words, these wonderful words, these compassionate, grace-filled words are not received particularly well. The conversation in John 10, 22 to 30, our text for this morning, begins with the encircling of Jesus and a confrontation and a very simple yes or no question. And the answer Jesus gives results in the murderous intent of his audience. They pick up stones to kill him. These gracious words, these life-giving words, these wonderful words fall on ears not ready to hear them. We're looking at John chapter 10 and verses 22 to 30. Read along with me. We'll read the text together and then we'll unpack it. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple of the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, these testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. This is a startling interaction Jesus is having here with the religious leadership. The Pharisees head up the apostate religion. They had claimed to speak for God. They had claimed to represent God. They claimed to lead people to God. They saw themselves as the gatekeepers. And Jesus is exposing them in this chapter. We'll look this morning at five startling elements of this interaction with the Pharisees, this last public final interaction with them. We'll look first at the drama of the setting. We find the setting here, and this is a dramatic setting in verses 22 and 23. Look down at John 10, 22. At that time, the feast of the dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. This feast of dedication is the festival we know today as Hanukkah. 
In 167 BC, Antiochus Epiphanes overran Jerusalem. He was an Assyrian. Uh, he was heading up what was then the, the Greek Empire. And he entered Jerusalem and desecrated the temple. He set up an altar to Zeus. He slaughtered pigs in the temple. He made priests uh, eat pork. He went into the Holy of Holies itself and declared himself God and demanded to be worshipped. The temple in Jerusalem was defiled for three years from 167 BC to 164 BC. This was in the time between the closing of the Old Testament and the opening of the New Testament. In 164 BC, Judas Maccabeus, Judas the Hammer, led a revolt. They reclaimed the temple. And then on December 14th, 164 BC, the temple was rededicated. They cleaned it out purified all the elements, the furniture, and the utensils, and then celebrated with eight days of lights and feasts. This celebration is Hanukkah today. It's not one of the three, law, uh, three feasts prescribed in Mosaic law that Jews were required to visit Jerusalem for. This was a fourth feast added by the Jews between the Testaments. This is the only time this festival is mentioned in the Bible. And they added this celebration to the three prescribed Old Testament feasts. And it becomes the backdrop for this scene in John 10. And the backdrop of this festival is dramatic for several reasons. First of all, the Maccabean revolt was political and military. This celebration is a, a national holiday. The people are remembering here a political revolution while they are under the oppressive overlord of the Roman Empire. For them, it's sort of like remembering 4th of July while being a POW in a foreign land. Looking back on this great Maccabean revolt, while they are now under a new regime, the Roman Empire did not allow the Jews to have their own nation, to have their own sovereignty, to exact their own laws, to enforce Mosaic law. They were subservient to the Romans. And so the Festival of Lights celebrated the last deliverance for the nation. It was in their recent memory. They could think back 200 years to when this thing happened. So when Messiah came, what would he do? Would he overthrow the Roman oppressors like Judas the Hammer? When Judas revolted against the Syrians and the Greek Empire under Antiochus Epiphanes? Antiochus Epiphanes was so evil, he was legitimately considered the prototype of the Antichrist. An oppressor of God's people. Sacrilegious and blasphemous, defiling everything that was precious to God and preventing the Jewish people from worshiping God in truth. When Messiah came, would he, would he do the same kind of thing that Judas the hammer did? Would Messiah bring about political liberty and reinstate Jewish nationalism? There's dramatic irony here. Judas Maccabeus removed the abominable defiler from the temple. He purified the temple so that God could be worshipped according to the law once again. And now in John 10... God himself has arrived and is walking in the temple complex. Remember in John chapter 2 that Jesus went into the temple and overturned the tables. Jesus himself purified the temple from those that defiled it. John 10 will culminate in attempted deicide. The attempted murder of God in the flesh. The people will want to stone him for what they believe is blasphemy. That's a dramatic backdrop to this conversation. Notice in verse 22, this took place in Jerusalem. There's no indication that Jesus has left Jerusalem since the Feast of Tabernacles and the healing of the blind man. Uh, the blind man was healed in John chapter 9. This is probably two to three months later. There's an interval of a couple of months between verse 21 and 22. The Feast of Tabernacles, which was the setting for the healing of the blind man and the setting for Jesus' declaration, I am the light of the world, was also a festival uh, significantly held at nighttime in the temple complex where the temple itself would have been lit up by candles and bright fires everywhere set against the darkness of the surrounding night for Jesus to stand up in that festival and say, I am the light of the world. Hear this 
man standing in the, in the, in the darkness underneath the, the bright lights of the temple complex. The, the temple looks like the light of the world. And here's this man from Galilee saying, I am the light of the world. Those things are dramatic. And the healing of the blind man is a, a declaration that not only is Jesus the light of the world, but he has supernatural power over light and darkness. And then he uses that platform to talk about the darkness that the spiritual leadership is still in and how desperate they are, uh, how desperately in need they are of the light that Jesus is. And these themes of light and darkness run all through the gospel of John, particularly in this section, uh, John 7 through John 10. And these two festivals back to back, both marked by bright lights in the temple complex, while the temple itself is spiritually dark and the light of the world has come and proclaimed himself to them. We learn in verse 23, it was winter, December, cold wet, rainy oftentimes in Jerusalem, and dark. And the scene adds to the effect of this confrontation with the Pharisees. Harvest time is over. Winter has come. It's dark. This is the last public conversation that Jesus has with them. The mood is dark. Jesus is walking here in the portico of Solomon. This is a covered walkway along the east side of the temple, supported by 45-foot high columns. There was a roof on top of these columns. It would give shade from the sun in the summertime and then shelter from the wind and the rain during the winter months. This is the place where the scribes taught publicly. This was like public school at the temple complex. Later, this is where the early church would gather publicly for worship and instruction in God's word. And Jesus here is walking. That's the dramatic setting. Notice next the hostility of the confrontation. Look at verse 24. The Jews then gathered around him and they were saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Gathered around in the New American Standard is a nice way of saying it. The Greek word here means to encircle or surround. They have cornered Jesus. There is going to be no escape for him until he answers their question. This is their turf. And they have cornered Jesus in a very public place. And they are looking for an incriminating answer. This conversation is an interrogation looking for a crime. They have nothing on him, but they're hoping to get him to say something out loud that they can use against him. You see, at this period in Jewish history, the Jewish nation was not allowed to inflict capital punishment. Uh, The Romans were their overlords, and and the Romans held that uh, particular privilege to themselves. The Romans were in charge. So if the Jews were going to execute Jesus, they would eventually have to get the Romans to do it for them. So that means they must have evidence of a capital crime that Romans would be willing to prosecute. Now, they're offended by the things Jesus has said, but the Romans wouldn't be offended at a guy saying, I'm the good shepherd. It's not a capital offense in Roman law. Someone claiming to be Messiah, an upstart king who would take over the world. Now, that would be a punishable offense. So they've cornered Jesus and they're trying to get him to answer in a way that they can take before the Roman overlords. They complained, how long will you keep us in suspense? And the original language here is dramatic. Literally, it is, how long will you lift up our souls? (laughs) You're holding us up in the air. Just tell us what we want to know. And the implication of this demand is that somehow, some way, Jesus has not been fair with them. And listen, this is a pretty normal response from a heart of unbelief. To hold God accountable for my reticence to follow him. My heart is not soft toward him, and I want God to get the blame for it. They can't get what they want because Jesus won't give them the answer they are looking for. So they demanded, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Verse 23. This is not a sincere inquiry. 
They're not investigating uh, so as to yield themselves to Messiah when he shows up. Their malice is just under the surface of this request. Glance down at verse 31. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. That is to throw rocks at him until he is unconscious and dead. This is murderous intent right under the surface. This is not an eagerness to believe. This is not an innocent question. If you tell us you're the Messiah, we'll embrace you. We'll rejoice and we'll be your evangelists. We'll tell the whole world. No, that is not their heartbeat here. They are pretending a lack of evidence while maintaining obstinate, hard hearts. Maybe you've heard someone say, well, I would believe in God if he just gave me some evidence. I mean, if he just proved to me that he really existed, oh, I would believe. These are not sincere inquirers investigating Jesus' qualifications as Messiah. They really just need Jesus to say, I am the Messiah, so that they can have on record words incriminating enough to compel the Romans to do their dirty work. They are murderers. The setting is dramatic. The confrontation is hostile. Let's look next at the exposure of unbelief. Verses 25 and 26. Jesus answered them, I told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name, they testify of me, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. Jesus answer to their inquiry goes all the way through verse 30. And the first order of business is to expose their unbelief. Jesus strips away the charade of their innocent question. The Pharisees thought they could cloak their unbelief in innocent sounding questions, scholarly inquiry, expert investigation, and Jesus takes it all down. It's interesting to watch the way unbelief in our world today mimics this very thing. I'm just asking questions. I'm just doing all the investigation. I'm just checking up on all the scholarly background. We don't want to blindly believe anything, do we? Jesus responds to them, I told you and you do not believe. Notice the present tense here. Uh, you do not believe. This is an ongoing problem for them. By the way, where did Jesus actually say to the Pharisees, I am the Messiah? What does he mean when he says, I told you and you didn't believe? Well, you're not going to find anywhere in the gospel of John or the other gospels where Jesus spoke to the religious leadership and said, here I am. I'm the Messiah. Check my credentials. He doesn't say it that way. In fact, a yes or no answer to this question would be misleading in this context. If Jesus said yes to the Pharisees question, are you the Messiah? What are the Pharisees thinking about Messiah? Judas Maccabeus 2.0, another hammer. Are you the hammer? Are you going to set us free? Are you going to set the nation free through political revolt from the Roman overlords? By the way, the Pharisees had a vested interest in the overlordship of the Roman Empire. They were actually in league with the oppressors. As much as they would pretend uh, that they had uh, national sovereignty in their mind, their power was actually secured. Their position was fortified by their agreements under the table with the Romans. They knew that a Judas 2.0 would dislodge them of their position. If a political military revolt emerged, they would be out of their place. They knew this. To answer yes to their question, are you the Messiah? Answering on their terms, answering yes to their version of what Messiah would come and do, would be misleading. 
Jesus was not there to lead a new revolt against the Romans, to start up a militia movement and and get some followers who would take up arms against their oppressors. Now, make no doubt, one of Messiah's tasks will be to overthrow Rome, Rome 2.0. That is, at the end of time, when Jesus comes back to the earth, he will not only overthrow the revived Roman Empire, but all of the armies of all of the nations of all of the earth allied against him and against his people. He will bring spiritual renewal to the people of Israel, as well as physical security in the land. He will do that. The Old Testament promises that about Messiah. But they have missed something significant about Messiah. He will not only be the reigning king over all the earth. He also comes as a suffering servant. They did not know that before Jesus came to reign on the earth, he would come a first time to pay for sin. This undermines their position and power as well. So it would be not helpful for him to say, yes, I am Messiah in their context with their understanding. It would also not be helpful for him to say, no, not helpful because it wouldn't be true. He is Messiah. So how has Jesus put forward his messianic credentials for which the Pharisees would already be accountable for rejecting? He alludes here to his words and his works. I told you. What has Jesus said? What words has he already uttered in the gospel of John to reorient messianic expectations and to affirm his own credentials as Messiah? Back in chapter one, uh, turn with me in the gospel of John. We'll just do a quick survey here. Where has Jesus affirmed and where has John the narrator affirmed that Jesus is indeed Messiah? In John 141, we have the record of Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found Messiah, which translated means Christ. So Andrew knew at the beginning of Jesus' ministry that Jesus was Messiah. Look down at verse 49 of chapter 1. Nathanael answered Jesus, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Very interesting, at the opening pages of the Gospel of John and the opening scenes of Jesus' ministry with his disciples, he is affirmed as Messiah, that is Christ, and the Son of God, and the King of Israel. And Jesus affirms all of these words. With a Samaritan woman in John 4, we have a really remarkable statement. Jesus says in John 4, 26, I who speak to you am he. What is the he there? Look at verse 25. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, the one called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus says very plainly, John 4, 26, I am the Messiah. To whom did he say it? A Samaritan woman. The the least likely candidate to hear the heralding of this exciting news. The Samaritans were the half-breeds despised by everybody. And a sinful woman in the middle of the day alone going about her business was the least likely candidate to hear this announcement. And Jesus declared it to her. Look down at John 4, 42. The Samaritan population believed because of Jesus' words. And they were saying, verse 42 to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this one is indeed Savior of the world. So who is Jesus so far in the Gospel of John? Very clearly, Christ, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah. He is Son of God. He is Savior of the world. And he is the King of Israel. All of these things linked together. Of course, the man born blind after he was healed by Jesus uh, said, uh, tell me who he is and I will believe. Jesus said, John 9, 37, you have seen him and he's the one who is talking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. 
And the man healed of his blindness acknowledges Jesus as master and as God. Of course, this healing was done very publicly, and it is the offense of his healing on a Sabbath that the Pharisees are all worked up about here in John 9 and John 10. Jesus very publicly has given his I am statements. John 8 in the dramatic setting of the temple complex lit up with fires. I am the light of the world. And the use of the I am phrase, a reference to the self-existent Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. Jesus is claiming deity in giving this statement. In fact, when you get to John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am, not I am something, but simply I am, Jesus is making a very clear declaration that he is God in the flesh. And notice the response of the Pharisees in John 8, 59, they picked up stones to throw at him. They knew what Jesus was saying. And of course, in John 10, when Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd, And he enters into the den of the Pharisees and rescues his own sheep, brings his own sheep out of their lair, calls them his own, says he's laid down his life for his sheep. And his sheep hear his voice and they follow him. And this blind beggar follows Jesus out of the lair of phony religion. All of this was an offense to the Pharisees, but all of it simultaneously is a declaration that he is God in the flesh, a fulfillment of Ezekiel 34, where God himself said, I will be their shepherd and I will come and get my sheep. Jesus is doing that very thing in John 10. The Pharisees as experts in the Old Testament would have known all of this. Furthermore, in Jesus' words, we have the record that Jesus taught as one having authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus' words to the Pharisees, Jesus' words to the Samaritan woman and to his disciples, Jesus' words in private and in public, all attest to the fact that he is Messiah. And and what is Messiah? A son of David, the son of God, the king of Israel, God in the flesh, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, the life, the light of the world, and Savior of the world. All of these are very clear statements from the lips of Jesus. The Pharisees here weren't lacking information. They simply did not believe. Look at the second half of verse 25. The works I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Okay, I'm going to call out my son for a moment. Pardon me. Pardon the interruption. Emmett, there's a mug by your chair. Will you bring that up to me real quick? Thanks, bud. (coughs) Thank you, son. Jesus goes on and said, it is not only his words that they deny, but his works. And notice what he calls them in verse 25. The works that I do in my father's name, these testify of me. To to do something in the name of someone is to invoke the character, the purposes, the attributes, and the authority of that one. For Jesus to say he is working in the name of his Father is not only ascribing a unique and personal relationship to God, an intimate one calling him Father, a personal one calling him my Father, and then saying the things that I'm doing are his commission. They are in agreement with everything that he is doing. This would be an audacious claim for anyone other than God the Son in the flesh. And what are Jesus' works that he does in his Father's name? First of all, just the totality of his sinless life. He has never sinned. He is unimpeachable. There, There is nothing they have on him. And all that Jesus does, marked by kindness and compassion, a love for sinners... Jesus' works were marked by a holy zeal for God's honor, like cleansing the temple in chapter 2. 
Jesus' works were marked by creative power. He made things out of nothing, turning water into wine in chapter 2, feeding 5,000 plus in chapter 6. He healed a man paralyzed 38 years in chapter 5. And following that healing, John 5.18 Uh, records this. Therefore, for this reason, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also he was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. The, The Jews knew what Jesus was saying when he said, I am doing the works of my father. He wasn't claiming some sort of universal, we're all God's children. We're all equal. No, he was claiming something unique and superlative. This was a claim to deity, a claim to his own divine sonship. And this just produced murderous intent after the miracles. The healing of the blind man in chapter 9 should have provoked a response from the leadership. Oh, Messiah is here. Instead, it provoked, oh, Messiah is here to kill him. In chapter 11, Jesus will resurrect his dead friend and the Jews will plot to kill them both. What are Jesus' other credentials? He's of the line of David, born in Bethlehem. All the things the Old Testament prophets said he should be as Messiah. His way was prepared by the Elijah figure, John the Baptist, the last Old Testament prophet. But what does Jesus say in verse 26? But, and that is a strong contrast, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. What does that mean? The words are clear. The works are clear. They testify. But you do not believe. Clearly, the issue is not the evidence. It's not about the information. There is a moral calamity much deeper than a lack of knowledge or incomplete information or not enough evidence or no compelling proof. They do not believe, verse 26 says, because they are not sheep. Listen, a mixed response to the gospel does not prove a problem with the gospel. Don't confuse, friends, the issue of evidence with the moral calamity of unbelief. God has not left the world without evidence. God has not left the world without evidence that he exists, that he is powerful, that he orders the universe after his own plans. Romans 1 is clear about that. Psalm 19 says the creation screams the glory of God. And Romans 1, 18 and following says men are accountable because God's attributes are clearly on display through what has been made. Men are without excuse. Additionally to that, God has placed in the human heart a knowledge of himself, Romans 1, and a knowledge of right and wrong and the awareness that men are accountable to right and wrong, Romans 2. So a mixed response to the truth of God does not prove a problem with the truth of God. A mixed response to the created universe does not mean there's no evidence that God made everything. It simply reveals the calamity of the human condition. Men suppress truth and unrighteousness when truth is right in front of them. Romans 1.18. They love darkness rather than light. John 3.19. When the light of the world comes in their midst. We might suppose that the Pharisees were inclined to believe just as long as they got the question answered or got enough evidence to tip the balance. But such a view puts man as prosecutor and God in the defendant's chair. As if God were on trial over whether or not he exists and man in his arrogance decides the verdict. Think about that arrogant man. Suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, in love with the darkness, denying God's existence, rejecting Jesus' messiahship, or refusing any of the, of the truth of God's word, while that man, all the while, his very existence is being sustained by the one he's denying. It's as if, as others have said, man is standing in God's sustaining palm, slapping God in the face. Denying his existence. 
Think about the religious leaders in this scene in John 10. They spend their whole lives in the course of religion, claiming to speak for God, supposing to represent God before the people, and rejecting him while he stands graciously, humbly before them. Why did they not believe? Verse 26. Because belief belongs to God's people, to Jesus' sheep, and they are not his sheep. That's what Jesus says to them. This is startling. Sheep believe, non-sheep do not. Non-sheep do not hear, they do not follow, they do not obey. They are not known by the good shepherd. And what a tragedy this is. If you're taking notes, you can write down Romans 2, 17 through 3, 3. Romans 2, 17 to 3, 3. We won't turn there now. But it is a description of the great privileges of being a Jew, having close access to truth. And what a tragedy it is to have access to the divine oracles and the Messiahship of Christ by lineage and yet not believe. All of mankind in his sinful state, in his rebellion, in his spiritual deadness is not inclined to believe. As if we're, we're just almost right there. We want to believe. We're, we're eager to believe. Just waiting for the evidence. Spiritually dead sinners must be given spiritual eyes. They must be given soft hearts. They must be given ears open to the truth. Saving faith belongs to those whom Jesus draws to himself by sovereign grace. In this very chapter, Jesus said, I lay down my life for my sheep and my sheep hear my voice. Those who do not hear, those who do not follow, those who do not obey, do not believe because they are not my sheep. Every successive miraculous sign that Jesus would perform would only have the effect of hardening the hearts of those who would not believe. Think about Jesus' own resurrection. What did the Jewish leadership do when they could not deny Jesus' own resurrection? Tell lies about it, pay people off, cover it up. How hard-hearted do you have to be to kill somebody who then comes back to life and not believe in him. That is the tragedy of the human condition. A mixed response to Jesus' words and his works are not the result of the confusing testimony of those words or of those works, but of the condition of the heart that is exposed to them. Now flip ahead to the conclusion of the Gospel of John. Look at verse, uh, chapter 20 and verse 31. Jesus did many more signs than are recorded in the gospel of John, verse 31. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, that he is the son of God and that believing you may have life in his name. Really interesting irony here. We're not personal eyewitnesses to these things. We have them secondhand. And yet they are so clear and so compelling by God's word that we must believe. We're obligated to believe. And anyone who believes in Christ, that he is who he says he is, and entrust themselves fully to him, actually become possessors of eternal life. And here in John 10, Jesus is before the religious leadership who should have been looking for Messiah, anticipating his coming, should have believed him on the spot when he came. They are eyewitnesses to his words and his works, and they reject him. What a tragedy. There's a fourth starting element in this interaction. And it is the security of belief. The security of belief. Listen to these words. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. These are marks of belief. Marks of true sheephood, we could say. 
all of which point to the startling security of true belief in Jesus. We could summarize them this way, recognition, relationship, obedience, life, and safety. First of all, recognition. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. For those who are quickened, effectually called, made alive, they hear just Jesus speak and they recognize his voice. And it doesn't say, uh, maybe my sheep will hear my voice or some of my sheep will hear my voice. But Jesus' sheep hear his voice. It is a fundamental definition of a sheep. They recognize the sound and words of their shepherd. Think back again to the scene of the Middle Eastern shepherd calling out his own sheep from a community sheepfold. A hundred sheep in a community pen and several shepherds over the various flocks that are mixed and intermingled in that pen. And the shepherd calls his sheep and they hear his voice and they follow him. How do you know which sheep belong to the shepherd? He calls them, he walks out and they follow him. It's just what sheep do. It's a remarkable metaphor for followers of Jesus. Those who are truly here, his recognize his voice. That is recognition. Next relationship. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And and grammatically, there's an emphatic uh, I here. I myself know them. This is personal for Jesus. This shows an intimate relational knowledge. Jesus' knowledge of his sheep is personal and affectionate and forever. Christian, Jesus knows you. He knows the facts. He knows everything about you. And he knows you. He knew you at your worst and loved you and laid down his life for you. Listen, you cannot out his love, Christian. Sheep are weak, vulnerable, easy prey, stupid. I was reading this week about sheep being cast. Do you know what a cast sheep is? That's when a sheep tips over and ends up on its back with its four legs straight in the air. And Apparently, sheep haven't worked on their core. And particularly when sheep have not been shorn or when they tip over in a bad spot, they cannot right themselves. And in the Middle East on a hot day, a cast sheep might last several hours before dying. In a cooler environment, a sheep might last a few days before the internal gases built up and the sheep is no longer able to circulate blood through its body. If sheep get lost, they don't know how to get found. I was reading about a a Texas sheep rancher, and I know that's not an exact approximation to Middle Eastern shepherding. They're different. They talk different. But a Texas rancher was talking about his sheep. And and if a sheep gets separated from the flock and if two sheep go over the hill away from the rest of the flock for grazing lands, a wolf will take one sheep and the other sheep will just stand there and wait to be dessert. It doesn't say, oh, my brother sheep just got eaten by a wolf. Um, I better go back to the flock. They're just over that hill I came from. They don't know and they just stay there. Sheep need a shepherd. Jesus, the good shepherd, comes and gets his sheep. And there's a reason the Bible calls us sheep. Weak as we are, vulnerable as we are, needy as we are. But one of the beautiful things about sheep, dependent as we are. To be a true sheep of Christ, to be a true follower of Christ, is to recognize your weakness and actually be dependent on Jesus. And he's good. There's a relationship here. 
He laid down his life for you when you were at your worst. He brought you into fellowship with himself. And this becomes an unbreakable relationship based not on your performance, but on his purpose. He initiated the relationship and he has guaranteed the relationship with his own blood. Christian, he laid down his life for you. The price has been paid. You are his sheep. True belief is marked by recognition and relationship and then obedience. Look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. They follow me. What do sheep do? They follow the shepherd. Again, no might, no maybe. They do. That is what sheep do. They follow their shepherd. Obedience is a staple and a mark of the Christian life. Without obedience to Jesus, you are no Christian. It is part and parcel of what it means to be Jesus' sheep. You follow him. What else marks belief? What else marks genuine sheephood? Look at verse 28. Life. Jesus says, I give to them eternal life. Again, another emphatic I. I myself give them life. Notice, first of all, this is a gift. Jesus gives them life. Sheep don't earn life. Believers don't merit life. And if life is not earned, it cannot thence be unearned. You can't demerit life that is given. And this is eternal life that is given. This is an implicit claim to deity on Jesus' lips. Who could give eternal life? Only one who possesses it intrinsically. The father has life in himself and he has given the son to have life in himself. And the son gives eternal life to whom he wishes. Jesus gives his sheep eternal life. Eternal life here, yes, it is a quality of life that begins as soon as you believe. But it is also a duration of life. It is eternal life. There is no decline, no decay. And this eternal life is a present possession And if it could be lost, it would not be called eternal life. What would Jesus have to say if this life given was losable? He would say, and I give them contingent life. And I give them conditional life or probational life. No, none of those things. He says, I give them eternal life. And safety marks belief. Look at verse 28. They will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. They will will not just be lost of their own accord and they cannot be snatched away by some enemy. When Jesus says they will never perish, verse 28, he uses the strongest negation possible in the language. It removes potentiality. It's not possible that they could perish. And if Jesus could lose a sheep, he fails at his father's commission. While the blind man could be cast away from Judaism, no sheep could be cast away from Jesus, the good shepherd. None could ever be lost. And the end of verse 28, no one will snatch them out of my hand. Snatching here is a violent seizing. It implies that there could be real threats. Look, a snatching wolf might be stronger than you, but not stronger than your shepherd. My security is not dependent on the strength of my grip. And no matter the threat, no matter the force, no matter the evil intent of someone or something set on snatching away one of Jesus' sheep, nothing even has the potential of being successful at severing sheep from Jesus' good, strong care. That is the security of belief. It leads to one more startling element of this interaction with the Pharisees. Christ's collaboration with his father. Look down at verse 29 and 30. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. This builds on the security Jesus has just been speaking of. And notice Jesus says, my father who has given them to me is greater than all. By saying my father, Jesus again here is claiming a unique relationship to God. 
Remember back in John 5, 18, the Pharisees wanted to stone him on the spot just for saying, my father. And he says, my father has given them to me. The shepherd's task is to secure his sheep. It is his father's commission. Listen, sheep believe because they are Jesus' sheep, and they are Jesus' sheep because the Father has given these sheep to the Son. This chain goes all the way to the top. Jesus rescuing his sheep is his Father's business. And he says, my Father is greater than all. Jesus' Father is God Almighty. He is the biggest and the strongest. He possesses all authority. His authority is unchallengeable. His will is unthwartable. He always gets what he wants. And so if Jesus is in league with, collaborating with, in cooperation with Almighty God, and if there is no separation between the plans, purposes, priorities, and power of the Father from the plans, purposes, priorities, and power of the Son, then the sheep are doubly, infinitely secure. The mission of Messiah is unquestionable, unstoppable. Who are these puny religious leaders before the power of the triune God, the maker and ruler of all things, who has come to get his people? And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand, Jesus says in verse 29. In case you wondered if being held in Jesus' hands, uh, somehow you could possibly slip out, fall out, jump out of his hand. No, there is another hand over. This double security is infinite in its power, immovable in its purpose. And the power of Almighty God reposes above to keep us secure. Who could dislodge from God what he has deemed precious to himself? No one. Nothing. The son is in league with his father. He is carrying out his father's business. And so the sheep are secure. And those who oppose the sheep oppose the sheep's shepherd. And those who oppose the good shepherd will discover that they are in opposition to Almighty God himself. And read verse 30. I and the Father are one. Okay, some technical grammatical observations for a moment. In Greek, you have feminine and masculine and neuter uh, words. This is neuter. That is, I and the Father are one thing. It is intentionally not masculine. Otherwise, it would be read, I and the Father are one person. Okay, this is just a little technical grammatical aside to let you know that the the Bible is very precise in its description of inter-Trinitarian relationship, affirming the essential deity of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God, while also maintaining the distinction in the persons of the Godhead. There is one God in three persons. That's on display right here in this verse, even in the use of a neuter pronoun. The Son and the Father are not one person. They are not the same person. They are separate persons, but they are one. They are of one essence. Uh, Another technical grammatical detail here. uh, The word for one is not the the word one that's used of personal identity. Uh, It is another word one that indicates the unity of essence. Why is Jesus doing this here? Why is he affirming his essential oneness with the Godhead? Why is he saying, I am God as the Father is God? I think what's implied in this statement is the the, the question here that we might have. Can, Can we be sure that the Almighty Father takes as much interest in the security of Christ's sheep as Jesus does here in John 10. Maybe you've had the experience of, of being with someone personally and feeling empathy, sympathy, compassion, and overpromising. Is Jesus out of step here? Not at all. 
Because Jesus and his father are one, one essence, one nature, one divinity. It means they are in one accord. It means there is one will that is the same power, identical operations. Jesus is not acting independently. He is not over promising. The sheep are truly secure. And with the effect of this last statement, Jesus wanting to ground the security of the sheep in the unity of the triune Godhead, he steps on all the toes of the Pharisees. How did this conversation start? Just tell us, yes or no, are you the Messiah? How does it end? I'm God. They got more than they asked for. And what is their response? Verse 31, they picked up stones again to stone him. We'll pick up their next week when we look at this. But think about these last two verses. The Pharisees got way more than they requested. They demanded a yes, no answer to the question, you're a Messiah. And they received a clear and startling statement that Messiah was none other than God tabernacling among them. And we know that they were offended by this. A mere man claiming to be aligned with God's will would not be blasphemy. Jesus is claiming far more than loyalty to God, synchronicity with God's desires. He's claiming to be God. The divine will is the shepherd's will. The divine power is his power. The owner of the sheep and the shepherd of the sheep are the same essence. So the love, the purpose, and the power of Jesus on display with the sheep here is the love, the purpose, and the power of God. J.C. Ryle, speaking of the security of believers, said followers of Christ might lose property, liberty, and life for Christ's sake, but their souls cannot be lost. Think about the corollary to that. What if you could secure all of your property? What if you could maintain all of your political liberty? What if you could ensure a long, healthy, comfortable life, but lose your eternal soul? What then? What is of infinite value to you, Christian? That can never be lost. This is such glorious comfort. Trials, hardships, uncertainties, turmoils, our own sin, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Take comfort in this. Do you feel sheepish? Small, weak, vulnerable, vulnerable temptation to temptations, vulnerable to enemies. Do you feel like a wolf's dessert in the middle of a field? You belong to the shepherd and he will not lose you. And no one can snatch you out of his hand. Take comfort in it. All sheep are secure. And only sheep are secure. Not wolves in sheep's clothing. They're not secure. Not goats who grew out their hair. (laughs) They're not safe. Pretend sheep. Make believers. Not safe. If you're here this morning or listening and you are a pretend sheep. Got a costume on. Stuff looks good on the outside. You blend into Christian culture. But you've never yielded your life. What does a sheep look like in verses 27 and 28? You recognize Jesus' voice. You are known by Jesus. You're in personal, intimate relationship with him. You follow him. That is, you obey him. If that's not you, this message on security is not for you. But friend, if you're here and you're listening... And you surrender your life to Christ, you will find yourself to be his sheep and to be eternally secure. The scene here is dramatic. It's winter. 
It's dark, cold, wet. Harvest is done. Last public conversation of Christ with the leadership. There are no guarantees of tomorrow for you. It is always a good time to take stock of your eternal state. Where are you, friend? Do you know this good shepherd? Are you secure in him? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we would boast in our safety in you. And it's not arrogant to do so unless we were boasting in our own performance or our own abilities. But we boast in you, our good shepherd, who keeps and holds and secures and promises. You have laid down your life in our place, purchased our eternal souls with your very blood to bring us to yourself. What good news from a good shepherd. What wonderful words. We pray that these words will not have fallen on stony ground, but God, would you break up that which is hard? Would you open eyes that are blind? Would you unstop ears that are deafened by sin and coldness? Would you bring about new life and belief even this day? We pray that you would be glorified as the good shepherd, even as we are eager and honored to be your sheep, to follow, to hear your voice, to obey. Wherever you lead, wherever you go, in your name, amen.